is our first uh, core works in progress of the academic year. So I want to just take a minute. We have some new folks joining us and old folks just to kind of share who we are as the core. And I think you could see here's our mission statement also included our link to the website. So if you're not already a member of the core, please, um, it's very easy to apply and become a member if you're interested. The link is there under the about tab. Um, there's a how to become a member. And so if you're not already a member of the core, would love to welcome you as new members. So I'm Mike Mugavero. I've been the director of the core, the extra E in the middle. So the Center for Outcomes and Effectiveness Research and Education. There's a lot of CORES on campus. Um, and again, this is one of our signature events and thank you all for joining us today. Want to just give a brief uh, overview of the things that we do within the core. So we have a distributed leadership team of directors, uh, Dr. Becky Ramey's our deputy director and Emily Levitan in epidemiology and Allison Hall from health professions are co-directors, uh, as well as a team of associate directors you can see and really organize our activities into three big buckets. So we have training programs, uh, learning health system initiative, and a number of our enrichment programs that include our works in progress. So a monthly seminar series that last year we moved to Tuesdays. We're always looking for folks who are interested in speaking. Um, we tend to focus on kind of methodological and the outcomes, health services, pop health space, things that might be approaches that are somewhat disease agnostic. So applied to one disease or condition that might have brought applicability to other conditions. So if interested in speaking at a future session, please let us know. We've got sessions open and always looking for folks to come and share the great work they're doing. So without further ado, um, and thank you for allowing that shameless core you know, infomercial to get us kicked off this academic year. It's really a thrill to welcome for the first session, uh, Dr. Ryan Kurt, who's uh, an, an assistant professor in emergency medicine here at UAB. We are in for a treat. I've had a chance to see Ryan present twice in the last month and you will not find a more dynamic or passionate speaker about what he does. So we're in for a real treat. And his topic today is a tale of two cities, cardiac arrest treatment and outcomes disparities in the United States. So uh, he went to medical school at Kansas City University in medicine um, and uh, biosciences uh, and emergency medicine residency at UAB. So I think we were very fortunate to recruit him here. Um, among his many accolades <laughs> at this very early stage of his career was this Sarnoff Cardio Cardiovascular Research Fellowship, which I wasn't familiar with, but a very competitive, very prestigious program that he completed uh, with Dr. Robert Newmar, who was at the University of Michigan, um, incredibly productive. So Ryan has already in his early career over 25 publications, a number of awards and grants from professional associations and society, including the American Heart Association and the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine. This is really a very abbreviated bio of someone who at, at this early stage in his career has had exceptional progress. Um, so um, Ryan, really, thanks so much for joining us. I will stop sharing and very much look forward to your presentation today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let me figure out how to get my shared screen here. All right. Can everyone, uh, are we good? Can we see the slides and everything? Yeah, perfect. Um, thank you all uh, so much for taking the time out of your day to, to join us here today. And for um, thank you to the core for allowing me to speak. I am so excited to uh, share our research and would love to get some feedback from the group um, towards the end. Um, so just real quick disclosure, I have a very small uh, grant uh, studying cardiac arrest burden of disease, and we're going to cover some of that uh, uh, data today. So for the past decade, I have been just fascinated with cardiac arrest. Uh, my wife would say just sort of obsessed with cardiac arrest research. The idea that someone can be completely pulseless, so no blood flow to the brain or vital organs um, in the most critical condition in medicine, uh, where inter uh, their likelihood of, of survival depends on prompt interactions and interventions within seconds to minutes, um, that if those interventions happen, you can actually bring someone from clinically dead back to life. Uh, so this is not exactly the same thing as heart attack. Most people in the lay public uh, think massive heart attack or heart attack and cardiac arrest is sort of the same thing. Cardiac arrest uh, can be from multiple etiologies, including um, nearly half or so from a myocardial infarction, but um, multifactorial. So this is, when you think of cardiac arrest, think of completely pulseless and sort of uh, and clinically uh, dead. 
And this is pretty common. So about 350,000 out of hospital cardiac arrests happen each year. Um, and specifically what I'm interested in is out of hospital cardiac arrest. So this is separate from patients that are admitted to the hospital and in some sort of uh, state of sickness. These are, these are people that are out in the community. They're at home, they're at work, they're at church, uh, they're at the airport, um, watching a football game at the park with their family. Um, average age in the country is about 63 years old with uh, a little over a majority being men. Um, and uh, have this event um, just on an ordinary day of their life that, in, in unfortunately, in majority of cases, uh, marks the end of their life. The survival rates throughout the country are, are pretty poor. So if you have an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest on a national level, about 12% of patients or uh, victims will uh, survive, leave the hospital and be able to go home with about 8% of uh, patients surviving neurologically intact. And obviously, that, that's the goal is for someone to survive, but survive uh, with their brain still functioning, that they can uh, still communicate with their family um, and sort of uh, live a productive life. What's really interesting about cardiac arrest is that truly where you live matters. Um, so where you are in the country at the time of your cardiac arrest impacts the likelihood of you surviving with a good outcome. Um, and this is sort of the, the twist on the title sort of to, to catch people and uh, to get them here is that depending on where you are, the likelihood of survival changes. So this is a famous paper by Graham Nickel published in 2008, looking at the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. So these are a group of cities throughout North America that contributed out of hospital cardiac arrest data. And what they found is that there is about a five-fold variation in survival. So at the time, if you lived in Seattle, you had about a 16% chance of leaving the hospital alive. Um, here it's listed as Alabama, it's our Birmingham data was about 3%. So you can see wide variation um, throughout the country. And what, what we're gonna touch on why that may be and what uh, potential um, interventions uh, could play a role in improving some outcomes. A decade later, same exact study was performed, but instead uh, the sites were de-identified. So uh, over there on the left, you see uh, the 10 sites, same sites as the, as the previous slide. Um, we're here at about 4.7%, but you still see uh, variation um, from tw almost 20% survival uh, to 4.7%. So a decade later, some improvement, uh, but still wide disparity in likelihood of survival, depending on where you are in the country. Going on an even smaller level. So this is when I was at Michigan, I looked at what is the variation in a single state. Um, so this is this is obviously uh, Michigan and we found that there's about a threefold variation anywhere from 4.5% to 15% likelihood of neurologically intact survival. So this is not just simply leaving the hospital but leaving the hospital uh, with uh, functional, uh, functional brain outcome. And then also wide variation in bystander response. So anywhere, depending on where you are in the mitten, anywhere from 32 to 53% likelihood of uh, receiving bystander CPR, receiving a, an AED by a bystander, anywhere from 3.5 to 11.5%. Um, if you think about sort of where we are in Birmingham, bystander CPR response is less than 20%. And bystander AED is really hard. There's very, few, very, very few cases, like some in the single digits over multiple years of cases of, of an AED being applied by a bystander. Um, getting even smaller. So this is, I thought this study is so cool. Just looking at even a single building, where do you live? So if you live above the third floor of a high rise in a city, your likelihood of surviving an out of hospital cardiac arrest goes down. May want to think twice about owning the penthouse. If you're above the 16th floor, less than 1% chance of survival. If that's the case, spend the money on an AED and make sure your family knows how to use it. Um, so why are outcomes so poor? Um, and this is uh, what, again, and something that makes cardiac arrest so interesting is that in order for there to be a good outcome, multiple components need to come together. Um, and this is sort of depicted by the American Heart Association in the chain of survival. So you'll see this in sort of the literature for the ACLS guidelines. And it starts on the left with bystanders. So people in the community recognizing that their loved one is not sleeping, they're actually pulseless. They're in cardiac arrest right now. We need to activate 911, um, the emergency response, begin CPR. So high quality CPR, if an AED is available, be able to use that AED and provide resuscitation until EMS can, uh, be, can arrive on scene. Once EMS arrives, they can begin advanced cardiac life support, transport to the emergency department where we have potential for some advanced therapies, activating the cath lab if this was a cardiac arrest related to a large heart attack. And then aggressive 
post resuscitative care and a lump in there, really important um, evidence based guideline directed neuroprognostication um, and survivorship. Um, so you can imagine that if one link in this chain is weak, then the likelihood of having a good outcome uh, begins to go down. The other part of uh, cardiac arrest is that in general, we have a pretty low level of evidence. So if you look at the recent, uh, there have been new guidelines, but a recent set of guidelines from 2015, there were 315 new recommendations, three quarters of level of evidence C. So this is expert opinion, a group in a room thinking or uh, based on the data saying that this is probably the, tr uh, the trajectory we should go on as far as guidelines with a little less than 1% being level of A evidence, randomized controlled trials, high quality data. Uh, furthermore, if you look at randomized control trials, so this is not in the United States, this is worldwide. There are less than five cardiac arrest randomized control trials published each year throughout the world over the past two decades. Um, so not a lot of research uh, in general being done. And this has been a common topic in the resuscitation science community um, and ultimately brings up the first knowledge gap. So I'm going to talk about three knowledge gaps today that uh, through my research I've tried to address. The first is, uh, is on this concept of what is the current landscape of resuscitation science research in the United States? We in the community have thought that really there are not a lot of investigators. It seems to be uh, a small amount of research being done, but really not a lot of, uh, of evidence to say, well, where are we currently and how much research is being done? What's the funding like? What are we addressing with our current research funding? Now, if you look at the NIH, uh, obviously everybody on this call is familiar with NIH, the largest funder of biomedical research in the world. If you think about the science that you do, and wonder, well, what it, how much money is invested every year in whatever you're studying? So let's say you're an ALS researcher. You can go through the funding portfolio at the NIH and say, well, in 2018, there was $42 million of research funded. And you can click on it and, and see which grants address that uh, and things of that sort. For cardiac arrest, it's not reported. Um, and so this was uh, one of the first things that I wanted to tackle is, well, can I identify which cardiac arrest grants are out there and what are we studying? And as you can imagine, um, NIH grants are all taxpayer dollars, so it's all available through NIH Reporter. Uh, so I created a search through uh, the NIH Reporter database with a string of resuscitation terms um, and ultimately yielded a search of about 1,700 grants that I then individually reviewed um, based on a uh, predetermined criteria that we came up with. So read 1,700 grant abstracts and said, well, does this fit cardiac arrest research? Does it not? And created now a database of about 15 years or so of every cardiac arrest grant that's been funded by NIH and compared that to other leading causes of death. Um, and so this is our paper from 2017. On the y-axis there, you have the top 10 leading causes of death. And then the x-axis is, uh, is arranged by NIH dollars invested per annual death. Uh, and so just for example, we have a stroke, and, it, and I apologize to any stroke researcher that may be on this call. It's going to sound like in the next few slides that I'm picking on stroke, but it, it's, it's sort of, um, I think, a good time-sensitive comparator for emergency medicine field that I'm in. And so there was about $2,200 uh, per death invested in 2000, um, this is 2016, published in 2017, in stroke research, about $288 million. If you look at cardiac arrest, oh, like a little too fast. Uh, about $91 per death, uh, $41 million in total. So orders of magnitude difference um, in leading causes of death when you compare uh, cardiac arrest um, funding. Now, this may not be because cardiac arrest is just simply not getting dollars. This is very well maybe due to a lack of investigators. And we don't know how many grants are, are applied for and things like that. So um, I don't want this to come across as we're just, uh, cardiac arrest is just simply not receiving any money and there's a ton of grant applications. We don't know. Um, one of the criticisms that came out of this paper was that it's not all about mortality. Think about the morbidity that's associated with uncontrolled diabetes, that maybe that's where we should start thinking about investment is something that involves both morbidity and mortality. And so that led to step two. Can we use a morbidity and mortality measure and how would this figure change? And that was next. We're going to dive a lot uh, much deeper into disability adjusted life years for out of hospital cardiac arrest in the next step here. Um, but this is a similar uh, graph here. Same 2016 data, 
y-axis leading causes of disability adjusted life years. So a burden of disease measure that includes both morbidity and mortality. So not just death, but also, also survival with morbidity. And what we found here, and this is dollars invested instead of per annual death, per annual dally. Um, that for diabetes, about $287 per dally. For stroke, $92 per dally. Ischemic heart disease, about $55 per dally. And then for cardiac arrest, about $9 uh, per disability adjusted life year. So again, um, similar wide variation in funding um, or a large disparity um, when you look at overall burden of disease. Sort of in a similar light, uh, the next question is, well, if we know how much funding we uh, cardiac arrest is receiving, where are the funds actually being directed? Um, and so this is this was sort of a two part uh, where um, I was part of the study team here where we asked a very simple question to a group of ECC members. These are the, this is the group that creates the ACLS guidelines, the American Heart Association. I apologize. This is this will be the worst slide um, in the presentation because you can't hardly read it. Um, but it's the question is, what are the leading scientific gaps in cardiac arrest research? And number one was hemodynamic monitoring of goal-directed resuscitation. So during a resuscitation, are there hemodynamic mar markers that we could use and target in order to have a better outcome? And so, and there's uh, uh, nine others that we identified here. The next question and that we just recently published is, well, if we know the gaps, have we actually been funding the gaps? These are based off the 2015 guidelines. We've had five years of funding since then. Where, where have we actually directed the resources? Um, and what we found is that about a quarter of the grants did not address uh, a, a top scientific gap. And about half are directed towards the back half of that chain of survival. So sort of picture that slide that I showed a few moments ago. Um, most of the research is focused at post-resuscitative care. So how do we salvage brain tissue? How do we try to make the, the best of the situation that we have once we have received uh, or achieved return of spontaneous circulation? The person has a pulse again. How do we um, mitigate uh, ischemia reperfusion injury um, and things that can happen um, in the post-resuscitative phase? And as you can see here, very few grants in other um, uh, multiple uh, top gaps receiving uh, no grant funding at the time or no grant applications, uh, potentially. So does it matter? Why or did, like, should we be investing money in cardiac arrest research? Um, is this really a big problem? And I think of reviewer two. Every, every paper I submit I think there's always a reviewer too that has the same sort of comments. And I've actually changed my discussion to address these every time now. Cardiac arrest is not a disease, right? It is the final common pathway of death is one of the most common things uh, sort of that we, that we hear. That if you direct funds towards studying myocardial infarction and preventing heart attack, that potentially that is just as good as, as, as diverting funds towards resuscitation. I would, and, and I would imagine that you could sort of uh, think about it the way I do, that if you're trying to prevent sepsis or treating sepsis, that's a totally different ballgame as when a person is completely pulseless. And what is the science behind resuscitation and trying to, re to restore a pulse? And so I think part of the problem has been we don't really understand or think of cardiac arrest as its own disease state, and certainly that is debatable, but really understand what is the public health impact and what is the societal impact of cardiac arrest as a whole. And that if we understand that better, perhaps that would shed more light on whether or not this is actually worth the investment or should we sort of continue down the path that we're on. And so that brings the knowledge gap to, what is the public health impact of cardiac arrest in the United States? Does this matter? Is this something that we should care about? Um, if you go through the cardiac arrest literature, burden of disease in general is often um, just cited based on what is the overall incidence of cardiac arrest? How common is this? What is the mortality rate? So 90% or so throughout the country uh, on a national level. And then short-term neurologic outcomes. This is something in the field that we've gotten much better at. So there are recent papers going out six months post um, discharge. What is the neurologic outcome at that point? In general, outcome ends at discharge. So what is the CPC, the neurologic outcome at the time of hospital discharge? But really nothing more than that in terms of 
uh, morbidity, mortality. And I can imagine you, you, you know where I'm going with this. And it, it's into our DALI work, which I hit on a, a moment ago. So what are disability adjusted life years? This is a common public health metric used to estimate and compare health loss due to both fatal and non-fatal disease burden. I would imagine many people on this call are familiar, um, especially uh, through CORE, are familiar with DALI. Has two components. Uh, the years of life lost. So if you if your life expectancy is 65 and you die, and you unfortunately die at 55, that's 10 years of uh, of years of life lost. Um, and then years live disabled. So if you does if you survive a, a, a disease, what is the impact um, in in terms of morbidity or disability um, due to that disease state? You add those together, that equals DALI. Um, so you can think of DALI as morbidity and mortality into a single uh, public health metric. One DALI is equal to one healthy life year lost. The higher your DALI, think bad. Lower your DALI, that's good. Um, and you can actually, uh, this is, these are calculated. So the Institute of Health Metrics uh, over in Seattle um, publishes this every year and have had some really impressive publications in, in amazing journals. Um, you can actually search not only in the United States or you can search regions in the United States, you can search other countries. What are the leading causes of DALI in, in certain countries? Again, you're not gonna find anything on cardiac arrest. So this was an opportunity to say, well, can we leverage US data to determine what is the DALI um, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And for this, um, I use the, the CARES database. So this is the cardiac arrest registry to enhance survival. It's the closest thing we have to a national cardiac arrest database. 28 states throughout the country. Um, Alabama, we're now a part of it, submitting data to and tracking cardiac arrest. This is for quality improvement. So it tracks from the night time of 911 all the way through EMS care, um, through hospital care and hospital discharge. Um, uh, they're up to about 50% of the US population covered. Um, and we'll just sort of fast forward into what did the, what did the data show? So similar uh, chart to what we saw or figure that we saw earlier, on the left here are the top 10 causes of DALI for 2016, um, comparing our cardiac arrest data to the Institute of Health Metrics data. Um, and the x-axis is DALI per 100,000. So it's a DALI rate. Um, the, let me back up for a second. The red it corresponds to YLD, that's disability. So if you think of low back and neck pain, not a lot of people thankfully dying of low back and neck pain. However, lots of morbidity. So that's what's driving that. On the flip side, out of hospital cardiac arrest, ton of mortality. And if you squint your eyes, you can sort of see that there's a little bit of red there. That's the survival, that's the, the morbidity component there. Uh, so uh, looking at out of hospital cardiac arrest, the DALI rate was 1350 per 100,000. Um, and for stroke, again, sorry, stroke researchers, um, not picking on you, but uh, nine, uh, 980 per 100,000 uh, was the is the DALI per 100,000 for stroke. So you can see here that there's a pretty large public health impact when it, it comes to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Now, the topic of overlap is, is a big conversation, and there's certainly overlap between ischemic heart disease and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, just like I'm sure there's overlap between lung cancer and COPD, uh, diabetes, heart disease, um, other things that are, um, that are presented separately. Next, what's happening over time? So that was in a single year, um, and this paper we just published about a month or so ago, looking at the percent change in DALI over time, we actually found that out of hospital cardiac arrest uh, for a number of factors is actually the largest, had the largest percent change in public health burden um, when it, in terms of DALI compared to anything else with drug use disorders um, being uh, second during that time period. Um, so about a 40% increase in, um, in burden of disease for out of hospital cardiac arrest. This is primarily driven, I think, by the CARES registry growing. So us having a better representation of what is actually the incidence of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, what are outcomes? And as we increase that nationally, that tracking, I think we're finding that then actually the number of arrests are actually just much higher than previous estimates. Um, this is not published yet. This is uh, a paper that we're, uh, I'm presenting next month. Um, but thinking about, well, cardiac arrest is not all about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. There's other populations. So there's 
in hospital cardiac arrest. There's pediatric cardiac arrest. You can imagine what the potential life years are in that scenario. Um, and so really quickly, this is looking at in hospital cardiac arrest. They get with the guidelines resuscitation registry through the American Heart Association. Um, in hospital cardiac arrest, the leading, uh, the 11th leading cause of DALI, uh, this is in 2018, when you combine with out of hospital cardiac arrest, again, this is 2018, not 2016, so things shifted a little bit, um, but combining uh, the two, sorry about that, um, total DALI for sudden cardiac arrest in general um, combined just over 2,000 per 100,000. Uh, shortly, we'll have the pediatric data that we can add to this, and I would imagine um, the numbers are going to increase quite a bit. Finally, um, what about economic impact? Uh, and this is a paper that we just released looking at what is the labor, the impact of labor productivity loss based on the leading causes of, of death. Um, and labor productivity uh, sort of combines two things, market productivity. So the, the dollars you earn at work or through investments, and then also non-market productivity. And that's things like caring for others, volunteering, uh, volunteer services, things like that. And when you combine those two together um, to look at what the total productivity is per for age and gender, we find that there's about a $10 billion loss in labor productivity due to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest each year, consistent uh, with other measures that we have as far as being the third leading cause of this um, metric uh, for societal impact. So I think hopefully been able to sort of convince you that the public health impact in terms of morbidity and mortality is quite high. And now we're starting to dive into, and this is the first of hopefully a couple of papers looking at what is the economic impact. And in terms of labor productivity, loss of economic dollars, um, it's another uh, large impact uh, in the United States. And that sort of leads us to knowledge gap three. And I'm going to check the time real quick. Okay. Um, I'm moving faster than I anticipated, but I think that's okay. Um, knowledge gap three is where should we focus these dollars? So if I've convinced you that cardiac arrest is a problem, has a huge societal uh, burden, um, that funding, we're about anywhere from 28 to $40 million a year. That's how big the pot is for research dollars. Where should we actually focus those efforts? And I'll bring it back to that chain of survival that will be stuck in your brain for the rest of the day. Um, if you look at where money is currently going, like I said earlier, it's more on the back end of this chain. It's how can we improve EMS? What new novel antiarrhythmic can we give? How can we improve post-resuscitative care with very little funding on the front end? And I would argue that the links in this chain are not equal, that it actually is front-ended and looks more something like this, where the, the how should I say, maybe the, the, um, it, is, it is important for us to focus on the front end where bystanders recognizing um, cardiac arrest, performing high quality CPR, the community involvement um, is, is important or just as important as the post-resuscitative care and something that we should focus on. Why is that? It's because bystander CPR is known to work. It increases survival fourfold, less, uh, but less than 50% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the country actually receive uh, bystander CPR. And as I mentioned here locally, less than uh, 20% uh, of patients will receive bystander CPR. I think Denmark is the best example of why focusing on the community, focusing on bystander CPR works and has a lot of potential. Um, so this is just an unbelievable study looking at survival rates over a 10-year period in the country of Denmark. And what they found was that there was a three-fold increase in one-year survival. So surviving out of hospital cardiac arrest went up three-fold, and this is surviving to a full year. Um, how did they do it? They focused on community measures. So looking at how do we increase bystander CPR? And they were able to increase bystander CPR rates from about 20% in 2001 to 45% in 2010. Well, how did they do that? And if you look up top, they made mandatory education or resuscitation education in elementary schools. So all elementary students were learning bystander CPR. In order to get a driver's license, it became mandatory to learn CPR. Increasing CPR uh, self-instruction -instru kits, about 150,000 went throughout the country. So they, they were focusing on how do we improve community response and they were able to triple survival. 
this is so exciting. This is, I think, the key to improving outcomes here and improving uh, outcomes locally or nationally. And, and this is sort of uh, the direction that I want to sort of focus my career and, and move towards, and we're going to talk about in just a moment. The other important factor is neighborhood makeup. We know that, that neighborhoods with a higher percentage of Black residents receive less bystander CPR, the same thing for AED use. Um, so as you can imagine, this is, this is something that's an important barrier here in Birmingham um, and uh, will present some challenges in trying to improve bystander CPR rates. And that's sort of where the focus uh, of, of my research is headed. We also look at the same thing um, for income. So the neighborhoods with lower household income have lower bystander CPR rates, lower bystander AED rates. So all things to consider when trying to um, improve community response and outcomes. When we look at resuscitation science as a whole, when we think about what are the top gaps that we currently have, understanding knowledge gaps or understanding why bystanders fail to respond in all sorts of neighborhoods, this is an important gap. This is well recognized, was just published um, recently in the Institute of Medicine report and in, um, was listed as one of our follow-up gaps in, um, in our Delphi analysis. Actually, I have it right here. Um, so understanding why bystanders fail to respond, there's been one study um, in the past five years, which sort of loosely fits um, this, this targeted, uh, this um, gap. And so that leads to uh, the research question for uh, my, ultimately what I'm applying for is a K-23 to study this here in Birmingham. And it's to understand what are the barriers to bystander initiated cardiopulmonary resuscitation and AED use for the treatment of out of hospital cardiac arrest. The goals are to identify the barriers to bystander CPR and AED use and uh, following out of hospital cardiac arrest and to eventually design an intervention to try to improve outcomes um, here locally and throughout the country. AIM-1, and this is sort of, this is the true works in progress portion. I have no data to show you, just the idea of what we're, which, what we're uh, hopefully gonna attempt. And, and I'll say that this is uh, still in the rough draft phase. Um, to identify high-risk neighborhoods here in Birmingham defined as high out-of-hospital cardiac arrest incidents and low bystander CPR rates. We have a decade worth of that rock data, um, the, the early on in the presentation, presentation which I uh, reported to you. So that has where are the cardiac arrests occurring, who's receiving bystander CPR, what outcomes. More recently, we have now teamed up with uh, Birmingham Fire and Rescue, who has a, agreed to provide their data, and the CARES database, which now um, is a statewide, well, not statewide, but we are participating, um, and at least here in Birmingham, participating and contributing data. It's going to hopefully look something like this. Uh, so a few communities have, uh, have done similar work. Uh, this was out in Denver, where they were able to create a map of where are the high clusters um, based on um, census tracts. So that would allow us to have economic um, data and socioeconomic data and things like that. Where are arrests occurring at a high incidence? And at the same time, where are low bystander CPR rates to try to identify where are those high risk um, neighborhoods? AIM-2 uh, is broken up into two parts. The first is to engage in and do focus groups with real life out of hospital cardiac arrest bystanders. This is a hard population to study because you can imagine that this is a traumatic event to be part of, um, to witness someone, especially if you have no medical background, to witness someone in cardiac arrest perform bystander CPR, um, see them be taken away by EMS, um, or unfortunately, if someone actually dies in the field, you can imagine that is a traumatic event. Um, and what we're looking to do is to actually do focus groups with this population. And so uh, we'd love to be able to do some work here locally, um, and we're going to attempt to do that. But uh, another uh, path is to utilize the bystander support network. So this is an international online community of bystanders who are currently participating in research, mostly the post-traumatic stress component. Um, this is run out of Toronto and actually Katie Dainty who runs the network uh, is uh, one of the mentors on my grant. And so we're gonna try to identify what are the barriers? What did you experience when you went through this event? Um, was there anything that caught you by surprise or um, in any event? That, that, and that's sort of the path that we're gonna go down. 
aim to be uh, is to engage and interview community members here in Birmingham. So those high and low risk neighborhoods and identify barriers to bystander response. How, do, there, do the barriers that we find uh, through the bystander network, do they match the, the barriers here in our community? Are there unique barriers in our neighborhoods, um, something that we should target that would have um, meaningful outcome in improving rates? And then uh, finally is to design and pilot a targeted community intervention to overcome these barriers um, and attempt to improve uh, bystander uh, CPR rates and ultimately outcomes. Let me check on our time. Okay. Uh, and so this is the our, my last slide. Uh, this is sort of the summary here. Every time I present, I always say, Ryan, slow down. And I always move faster than I intend. Um, but ultimately, uh, there have been three sort of key points to take home here, and um, I hope I've described to you that overall there's a low level of evidence when it comes to cardiac arrest treatment strategies, and we need more research. Uh, this is likely in the form of we need more investigators, uh, people that are focused on cardiac arrest, that have novel ideas and are willing to write as many grants as possible and as submit as many grants as possible to try to overcome um, some of these barriers. Two. The public health and societal burden of out of hospital cardiac arrest is high. Um, and then three, I think directing research towards improving community response, similar to like what has been done in Denmark, it has great potential for improving outcomes, especially here locally. Um, and that's what I am uh, excited to try to, to try to do here in Birmingham. Um, so uh, with that, thank you all so much for taking the time out of your day. Uh, to listen to me, and I would love for some feedback, any questions that you may have. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Ryan. And maybe um, if you don't mind to stop sharing, we can get back and see if we, some other folks in the gallery want to engage. So as I said, I think we were in for a treat, and hopefully everyone enjoyed a tour de force, a really just fantastic presentation. <laughs> So um, really, no, it's tremendous work. And I think you've really synthesized it and shared it and made a compelling case for the importance of the work that you're gonna pursue with the case. So with that, um, I'd say we should open the floor for questions and we'll look and see if anyone has uh, questions. So we got an awesome job comment. I would agree with that 100%. <laughs> hey, I'll, uh, I'll weigh in here, Brandy McCluskey, I'm one of the, um forensic pathologist here at UAB and uh, medical examiner here in Jefferson County. I was just, I was just going to throw a plug out there. I'd love to chat more about your funding discrepancy that it's um, likely due to the quality of data, mortality data, data that's getting from uh, derived from death certificates. Death certificates are really um, abysmal nationally. And uh, so it's highly variable what's put on the cause of death statements. And most people don't realize that it directly impacts an IH funding dollar. So be happy to talk to you about that anytime. That's a great point. Thank you so much. Brian, hi, this is Allison Hall. I'm in the School of Health Professions. And let me see if I can sort of frame my question. I was really struck with your comment midway through. So I'm not a clinician, so I'll sort of add that to it. So, so forgive me for my question. I was struck with your comment that a cardiac arrest is not a disease. And that at the end of the day, we all will probably have cardiac arrest as we leave this environment, right? So um, Help me understand, and I guess what you're sort of saying when you're sort of thinking about your K and what you want to do is that what you're trying to prevent is some folks from passing away who sh should not be passing away, right? So I'm trying to sort of understand, if you will, this notion of maybe it's just your time. Sure. Right? You're older or there are other reasons and it's just your time versus um, it's not your time. And how do you sort of think about that question? Sure. And and so uh, that slide was uh, me sort of poking fun at reviewer two. Um, and that that's the comment that I always get all the time is that you're studying cardiac arrest, but cardiac arrest, everyone dies of cardiac arrest. Isn't that the case? And what I would say is that, especially with the CARES data, the database that we're looking at, where it sort of goes back to one of those early slides, the population we're studying. On average, it's about 63 years old. These are people that are not in nursing homes and bed bound. These are people that are out in the community, public arrests, um, thing, people that are just going, going about their day and were not sick prior to this and just had this event. Um, and so I think that's the different population. 
certainly what I expect this upcoming paper that we're submitting that includes the in-hospital cardiac arrest DALI, I think we're going to get a lot of um, pushback, I think, with that, because that's really a different population. Those are patients that are very sick. Um, and, uh, and so that, that sort of changes things. Um, but I think from the out of hospital cardiac arrest, the sudden cardiac, uh, death scenario of someone that's playing ice hockey and, and suddenly goes down, I think that is a different situation. And in, and, and in my view, this, this is a disease state when, when we're talking, when we're talking about that and that if we frame it that way, I think, um, that allows us to advocate better, um, as to, as, as opposed to saying, well, well, it's all, this is all heart attack. So if we study heart attack, we're, we're studying cardiac arrest uh, when the physiology completely changes when you're pulseless um, and things like that. Okay. And so that Netherlands, that study in Holland, I think I, I, you, you went through it quickly. Did they sort of also look at the burden? What they, so they, they improved the survival, if you will, right after cardiac arrest. Did, what was the burden of living longer now after you've had that? I mean, were they able to change that? So they, they, for cardiac arrest research, it was pretty strong in what they were able to do. They, they went, they followed patients for a full year. Um, and what is survival one year after the event? And I apologize for going through that uh, too quickly, a little bit of the adrenaline. Um, but uh, overall, they were able to triple survival with the incidents being the top line was sort of the incidents staying the same. And that was likely driven by the fact that they were able to increase bystander CPR from 20% to 45%. At the same time, they were able to see that shockable rhythms increased. Um, and what we find is that if a patient is in a shockable rhythm, so I think that breaks down to likelihood of survival. So if you're in, cardiac arrest can be broken up into, in general, four different rhythms, uh, two categories, shockable. So that's ventricular fibrillation and pulses ventricular tachycardia. That's what the AED works on. So that's a tachydysrhythmia that's out of control, that through electricity, you can restore a pulse. If you're in cardiac arrest, you want to be in one of those two because your likelihood of survival is much higher um, because electricity can fix that. If you're in the non-shockable category, so that is the flat line, the asystole that we see that sort of everybody that's on television that's in cardiac arrest is in that, um, or pulseless electrical activity where you actually have a rhythm, but you're not producing a pulse. What we find is that if you're in that shockable category where you want to be, if you receive bystander CPR, you can increase the, the length of time that you're in a shockable rhythm. If you're not receiving bystander CPR, you sort of degrade into one of those less favorable rhythms. And what they found over time is that shockable rhythms actually increased, likely again, part because they were receiving perfusion from bystander CPR. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Other questions or comments? So I might just jump in and you spoke with such ease about you know, qualies and dallies. And so I think a lot of folks are not maybe familiar with that kind of research and what, what goes into that. I mean, where did you, did you, did you do those analyses yourselves? Any insights for folks who are similarly thinking about doing this kind of work about quality adjusted or disability adjusted life years? Um, if you don't mind just sharing methodologically things that you learned yourself, did yourself and, and any guidance for folks that haven't done that but might wanna add that to some of their research studies. Yeah, sure. Um, that was through uh, sort of conversations with mentors, thinking about how do we best, what is the best way, or uh, how do we meet sort of standard public health measures to compare cardiac arrest? And someone at one of the AHA meetings, um, when I'm at meetings, I'm not afraid to, to talk to just randomly talk to people. And that actually came from a random conversation from a, uh, a, a woman who works in the pediatric ICU at Children's at, at CHOP, who mentioned, you, you know, you should really look into DALI. I had no idea what it was, um, but there are a million publications on it. And, and I remember reading um, uh, a few papers by Murray, Murray et al, who um, they, they publish out of the Institute of Health Metrics, and they do a great job of describing how it's calculated. And it actually is a pretty simple calculation that I was able to do with, I had a, a statistician, Brian Nathanson, um, who did the vast majority of the work, but it's something that I can still conceptualize and, and, and do at my level as well, where you're looking at what is the life ex for the YLL, sort of the years of life loss, that's, that's actually kind of simple. It's looking at what is the standard life expectancy based on age 
and then the mortality um, at the time uh, of, for whatever d disease state. And the difference between the two um, is the mortality component. Uh, the morbidity component, that gets a little bit more challenging, a little easier for cardiac arrest um, because unfortunately um, survival is low. Um, but it's, 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 it's estimating how long are people going to live post disease state? And then what is their disability? So you need a disability weight. Disability weights are published. So those are the things you can look up. Um, so uh, I think for cardiac arrest, it's a little less complex than other disease states that have high, uh, uh, high survival and high morbidity, multiple um, sort of disability weights that go into the calculation. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share um, our paper, which uh, has some of the references for the resources that we used. Um, but for me, with no statistical degree um, and help with uh, with a, a good statistician, it was um, it was a pretty uh, quick analysis to do, and we've done it now multiple times. So. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's fantastic, and you know, would encourage others. And I think on campus, a lot of expertise in the school of public health and healthcare organization and policy. I imagine, Allison, in Health Services Administration, too, with some of those type of analyses. Um, so a question in the chat was asking, so looking at your aims, are aims one, two, and three sequential goals or simultaneous goals? And what stakeholders have you identified to discuss interventions for BCPR in Birmingham? Yeah, uh, great question. Thank you, Keegan. Um, so I think, I think the the aims are sort of designed in in that exact sequence where i think importantly locally is going to be identify which of the 99 neighborhoods in birmingham are are, are highest risk um, and again that risk is the incidence of bystander cpr or incidence of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and subsequently low bystander cpr rates uh, my primary mentor michael kurz i think says it best that i think we all know about food deserts um, in different locations, there are actually cardiac arrest deserts here in Birmingham where uh, people have not survived in certain neighborhoods as far as we can tell in years of data. Um, so I think identifying those first and foremost is going to be really important. It's possible that we sort of see this across the board that um, unfortunately there are very few areas in Birmingham. I, I think it's possible that bystander CPR is very, very high. So there may be many high-risk neighborhoods. Um, that's sort of going to be uh, a challenge that we'll have to overcome. Uh, but the important thing is we do have the data, and I think that would be the first thing to identify. The bystander network, so, and this is why I hesitated at first, that could potentially be done right now um, because we have the population to study. We have uh, a population that's very eager to take part in research and currently taking part in research. And so I think sort of 2A, we could do hit the ground running, um, but I think we're going to sort of follow that sequence. Um, and then in terms of uh, stakeholders, um, I think Birmingham Fire and Rescue is a huge component because they are the EMS agency that's responding to many of uh, of the out of hospital cardiac arrest that we see, and and we need that data. Um, that data is really important. The the data that they contribute to our hospital li liaisons for the care registry is again um, something that uh, that we're going to rely heavily on. And it's like anything else: the quality of data in equals the quality of data out in the sort of the work that we're doing. Um, and so uh, having them participate is going to be important. I think. Um, sort of looking at what others have done and may be really important here in Birmingham, I think reaching out to um, sort of church communities and things like that in some of our neighborhoods are, are gonna be strategies that we use to, um, to reach, to reach uh, people within these neighborhoods and uh, design focus groups uh, and, and things of that sort. So I hope that answers your question. Great, thanks. Another question in the chat from uh, Yulia Kodneva said, great talk and any conceptual frameworks that are guiding your idea of barriers. So I guess either conceptual frameworks or theory that you're using to help you know, think around how you will approach the solicitation and the qualitative work of, of barriers. Yeah, so there, um, Camilla Sasson, who uh, is a resuscitating science researcher, she is, and I'm blanking on what location, where she is currently, um, but she has done similar work uh, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, this was back in 2013. Different demographics, 80% um, Caucasian uh, with 20%. Uh, I think in her study, the population is a little bit higher, but, but certainly 
uh, Columbus, Ohio, different demographics than we than we have here. One of the barriers that they identified was the idea of, am I going to get sick? Um, so if I have no medical background and I see a stranger down the street who looks pulseless and they're in cardiac arrest, is m- my intervention of bystander CPR going to increase my likelihood of, of getting sick? And, and certainly at the time, mouth-to-mouth was still a component of, uh, of uh, ACLS and um, of bystander response. Now it's really focused on continuous chest compressions. But we live in a day and age of COVID. Um, and how does that change anything? And I didn't cover this, but um, a paper that we're excited to write up right now is we just repeated the DALI analysis looking at post-COVID, so January 2020, how has the burden of disease of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest increased, and what has happened to bystander CPR rates? And I thought what we would see is that, especially for public arrest, because most public witnessed arrests are witnessed by a stranger. You're not actually with a family member. As opposed to at home, if it's witnessed, it's likely someone who knows you. And I anticipated that we would see for a public arrest, bystander CPR rates go way down, specifically for that reason, because everyone knows about the pandemic that's going on and could you potentially get sick from providing that therapy? And what we found is that bystander CPR rates did not change. So 46% compared to the previous year, which I think is, is, is incredible. Um, and it's just one example of sort of the framework that's out there. Another component is potential legal risk um, of thinking, am I going to harm this person? And would, I, would there be any legal ramifications? I think the largest barrier is going to be simply not knowing. Not knowing that this person actually is in cardiac arrest. They just had a seizure or some other sort of, they're in, in, they're in some sort of vague coma and um, I don't know what to do. And if dispatch is not providing dispatch instructions to do CPR, I think a lot of this is gonna be that the biggest barrier is simply just not knowing CPR. Great, no, thank you. So then um, Emily Spangler, who's in vascular surgery, Ask the question about, can you speak towards um, ways CPR training is provided in the community that bystanders might access? So what kind of training is available? And the idea that AHA's BLS course seems relatively complex, the level of training. So, you know, what, what are the training resources available for community member training? And that the training that many of us do in BLS courses are at a level of complexity, maybe beyond what might be approachable to folks in the general community setting. Yeah, um, that's that's a wonderful question, a great question. And to be honest with you, I, I'm not sure, um, and I don't know if he's available. But Michael, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call out my mentor right now and see if he's available. Michael, I see that you're on. Are you available to speak and address that for a second? Because I think you're probably the most knowledgeable um, on this topic. Michael Kurz, are you there? What I will do is I will um, speak with him and I will email you um, and and find that answer. Um, but that that that's a great question and something that we certainly uh, need to consider. And Ryan, I'll maybe just fit, build on that and maybe the final question, just in the interest of time, um, thinking about BLS and the role of you know CPR versus having an AED available and knowing how to use the AED. I wonder. You know, it, has there been able to distinguish between those two? As you were talking about VFib and the shockable rhythms, it would seem that having the AED and access to that is critically important. So I don't know if those are a package or, or how does kind of, you know, basic life support CPR relative to AED and maybe if those things can be disentangled and if through some of the geocoding AIM-1 work, is availability of AED something that's known? I mean, to know, is there even an an AED available in the church, the gym, the YMCA, you name it? Sure, Um, that is a a really important question and a really important topic. And even the, as simple as um, if an AED is available, when's the last time the battery was checked? Um, And those are all sorts of things that that are certainly things to consider. Um, I think the highest performing areas of the country have AEDs everywhere you sort of look. Um, I I, I think um, there are changes coming. Uh, There's research that we're going to be doing here uh, through our department that is going to have a pretty, and I I think that this is um, 
nearly set in stone, but we will be increasing um, AEDs throughout the community um, and AEDs that uh, have more capability than standard AEDs as part of a research project. So that's something that we're that we will be studying shortly. Um, but I think thinking about just my interaction with the community here, I don't see AEDs frequently. And so I think increasing access to AEDs, similar to what they were able to do in the Denmark study, um, would certainly um, improve outcomes, assuming we improve AED education um, yeah. and how to use it. And, and that's where some of these new smart AEDs that provide instruction and things like that, I think uh, could, could come into play. Great. Well, in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll close there. I want to thank you again for just a wonderful presentation. We'll look forward to having you back as your work progresses and hearing about your successes. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Again, it's our first uh, Works in Progress of the Academic Year. We'll do this monthly on Tuesday. If you're not a member of the core, please go to the website, sign up. We'd love to have you. We try not to send too many messages, but you'll get a number of announcements for wonderful seminars like this. So with that, again, Ryan, thanks so much. I want to thank everyone for joining us and have a great rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Thank you, everyone.